uh, check. Okay, uh, I'm going to give a talk today on using deep neural networks and understanding the mechanism of human behavior. I'm also going to, let's say, complain a little bit or, or go a little bit about our approach of science in general. And uh, maybe even that part is more, or I'm a bit more or less interested in your response to that part than to the using deep neural networks and understanding the mechanism of human behavior. So in my talk, I will start with uh, discussing some elements of modeling in psychology. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss deep learning as a model in psychology. How can you use, use it? What are its advantages? And then I'm going to go for two specific examples in scene segmentation, my own research line or the research line I work on and most of my PhDs. And then I quickly want to discuss prediction in the research cycle, and let's say the goal or, or well, what I thought. We'll, you'll see it when we get there. Okay, modeling in psychology. So. Uh, the, the scientific method, or at least the modern scientific method, uh, likely started with Galileo, who had an in innovative combination of experimentation on the one hand and mathematical modeling on the other hand, resulting in the start of, let's say, what you, or at least I guess that's the goodest point as any to take as the start of the modern scientific method, with uh, Galileo basically throwing objects from the Tower of Pisa, uh, measuring uh, the speed of which it's false, trying to model that. And in physics in general, the application of physics with engineering in the world has been, I would say, an inspiration and sound of an envy for psychology. And uh, of course, physicists have kind of have it easy. And, uh, if you look at uh, Galileo, his falling objects and gravity, uh, Einstein wasn't really dealing with another project. Uh, what was, it's kind of clear what needed to be explained and what was observed. Uh, and at and certain points, it might have become more complex. But in general, Falling objects, gravity, it's kind of clear what's into play. And for psychology, it is, of course, much more complex. Uh, we, for psychology, this is one much more complex. So we have, uh, on the one hand, folk psychology, the concept we all talk about, for instance, memory. Then we have some sort of scientific uh, definition of memory. The scientific definition of memory falls apart in lots of sub elements, way more than three that I had space for on my slide. And each of these is then measured with lots of different paradigms, which have a more a stronger or let's say weaker relationship to the original whole psychological concept. And so we as psychologists uh, are taking on a far grander challenge than physicists, even at the conceptual level. Now, one way to bridge this gap is the generation of quantitative models. And we, we, we want to relate tasks, behavior as, as much as possible in, in, in model steps. Well, that have certain elements or qualities. And uh, basically, we judge models by two, uh, in two ways. Uh, how interpretable is the model? Uh, do you get an explicit description of causes? And the other thing is predictive power. It is, it's kind of nice if the model uh, can predict something for new data and new situations. And a good model, and then the, the, I, I think there's broad consensus here, has both. Now, one way to, let's say, improve models or improve theory, or let's say, organize research is with the empirical cycle uh, introduced by Ade de Vogt in 1958. Notice it's a lot later. Physicists uh, in biology, you now get the empirical cycle, but physics as a science hasn't really changed because of the empirical science. It's really more to organize the type of stuff that we're doing. And a lot of, and that's understandable, if you look at the empirical cycle, there's a lot of focus on developing a good non-logical network in which, uh, the, uh, which has the representation of the concepts of interest, uh, the observable manifestations and the interrelationship. And, and you need, really need to have an idea about that. And then well, you can start thinking about an experiment. And in these experiments, and that's kind of crucial, sorry, in these experiments, and this is kind of crucial, we aim, to tell, we aim to develop an experiment in which all external sources of variance are removed. And you wanna isolate a certain effect as pure as possible, and uh, to maximize the chance of making a uh, causal claim. And this has a side effect, but we'll encounter later on again. Now, and we generally believe that if we discuss her, and, and, and I have, uh, I'm giving this uh, course on psychobiology, uh, scientific reasoning, and I just had this, uh, and then I asked questions in the beginning and just saw the results. And most students believe that indeed, if we discover the correct causal change, we are capable of making strong predictions. 
Um, however, the development in the last 20 years have suggested that these poles in practice are at odds because models that are easy to interpret generally have few parameters, and that's why they're easy to interpret, but they're really bad at predicting. Uh, namely, and there are some, uh, and we can discuss them, but, but let's say a, a model that works in the raw reality of the world that predicts anything with few parameters is rare. On the other hand, we have models that are really good in predicting, but these turn out to have many parameters and are difficult to interpret. So apparently, you can't have your cake needed. It's either one or the other. You can go for modeling, which is tractable, clear in causal relationships, but doesn't really give you lots of predictive power. And I would say that's problematic. Or vice versa, you can have models that are predictive, but you don't really understand what's going on. Maybe also not to do the most desirable thing in the world. And this tension between predictive modeling and hypothesis testing is particularly striking for cognitive research and for psychologists because we believe that the brain is at least partly involved in our behavior. Not in all our behavior, it's not the, the, the prime mover of anything, certainly not. Also, things change are complex, but even having a brain somewhere in the intermediate gives you an organ, a very, very parameter rich organ with something like 100 trillion adjustable parameters. And if you have an approximation of 100 trillion adjustable parameters, if it can easily be 1 trillion parameter more or less, it's very parameter rich. And uh, ah, sorry, I my computer froze or everything froze actually. Um, it's very parameter rich. And if we then go back to the empirical cycle, remember that in the empirical cycle we try to reduce. Uh, basically, we try to exclude as much as the world as possible because we want to isolate the effects. Okay? Our behavior is made abstract. So. From that perspective, you could say that research in the empirical cycle has no or little value beyond the conditions under which it was tested. Uh, it could have been the case that if you find these rules, you can apply them largely in general, but it does not appear to be the case. So, are there alternatives? And, and I would suggest it's interesting to look at models like deep learning as a model in psychology. What is deep learning? And uh, I, I presume most of you have some stuff. If, if I'm repeating stuff, my apologies, but just to get everything in place. If we look at uh, AlexNet, that kind of started, let's say, what you could call the deep learning resolution. revolution. AlexNet is a parameter-rich model that is trained with millions of stimuli to classify 1,000 different categories of images. And by a coincidence, it's like not a coincidence, it's like the reason it's that good. Its architecture turned out to be quite similar to the visual system. And uh, so uh, if, you, if you look at AlexNet here, uh, is my mouse visible? Good. Uh, if you look at AlexNet here, this is uh, this is a rep graphical representation of the model. This is the input. This is the output. There's classification on this side. Images are shown into this model, and then you have a filter bank. And at the bottom here, at the input, you have filters that are, let's say, very elementary, that are very simple and are uh, are actually you can find the same type of um, elements in the early visual cortex. And if you go deeper into the model. You see a shift in the receptive fields, and again, this shift is also observable in the visual system, where the receptive fields become larger, but more specific in terms of their responses. And so, when this model came out, neuroscientists like me, or psychologists, or cognitive neuroscientists like me, were really surprised that this model matched the visual system that well. And in one strike, it was also the best compu mechanistic computational model of the visual system, or at least of object recognition. Now, uh, what does this model do? What's kind of very cool about this model? If you show it an image, a real, real image, uh, it'll give you a classification. For instance, if you show this image, it'll tell you it's a border collie and it's likely to be correct. And if you show this image, it'll, it'll likely tell you it's a European short hair. And if you show this image, it'll likely tell you it's a poodle. And this is not trivial. This network has end to end behavior. And there's no token representation somewhere. It's not something like, oh, and these symbols are supposed to represent this. No. Actual images go into the system, actual classifications come out. And you can load it into a uh, camera and then you can walk past stuff and it'll say poodle, uh, like with a good chance of being correct if, if there's a poodle there, of course. And uh, there's been this gigantic development. There's been this gigantic development sorry, in which DNNs have been extended with, uh, for instance, reinforcement learning. And it allows for these networks to act and navigate with short-term goals. 
And with short-term goals, you can actually solve quite a lot of uh, these simple games like Pong or Space Invader. And there's no long-term strategy. You have to have know something of context. You have to know some, some idea of the spatial navigation of the problem, but, but that's kind of limited. And uh, with a deep Q network, that's basically, sorry, <coughs> I'm looking at the wrong image. With a deep Q network, that's basically a DNN network with on top of that a reinforcement learning network, you can actually learn these types of tasks. And uh, you can actually train these networks then to very well predict human behavior. And not only does it predict human behavior, well, if you look at the structure of these responses, you can find uh, complex analysis and not go into the basics, but you see that you kind of find these activity that is corresponds with in the brain in multiple type areas. And interestingly enough, more complex tasks like uh, Montezuma's Revenge, in which there's this spatial layout and there are these complex strategic goals, you, you can't learn to solve that with reinforcement learning, but if you get a more complex learning rule, in this case, curiosity, it allows uh, the network to solve more strategic games. And then this, the, the layout you get here, and I'm just showcasing this rapidly, uh, is one in which you generate a prediction at random, sorry, in which you generate a prediction, and then you generate an action. And then if you can actually predict it well, you're going to look for something else. Um, or at least uh, you can base reward learning on that. And, and that's a system, again, that is very similar to what we know is present in the human brain. Now, there's an obvious critique of DNNs as models in psychology. And you could say, well, I, I, I belong to this camp that wanted to understand. And prediction is nice, but first of all, I want to understand. And in that case, you could say that you're replacing one black box with another black box. Right? Or another way to make that argument, the clone of a system might have the same behavior, but does not increase understanding. And from that perspective, DNNs are typical predictive models, not a solution at all for those interested in cognition. Okay, are there, uh, is there something I need to clarify at this point? Are there questions? So if you uh, fundamentally disagree with me about the uh, things I said about the empirical cycle, let's wait for that at the end. But then are, are there questions for clarification? I, I, I don't want to lose you at this moment. We can just, no? Okay. So we have this tension. On the one hand, we have these uh, predictive models that are great at explaining stuff. At the other hand, uh, but they're apparently not that tractable. On the other hand, we have these models that are tractable with these causal relationships, but they're not that good at predicting. And the saying is, you can't have your cake needed. And they say you can't have your cake needed, but why not? If I have it, I can eat it. Just try to stop me. So in uh, 2018, I published this paper, Fantastic Animals, and there are some uh, quite similar papers around that period that make the same point, or roughly that point. But you could say that an artificial agent can be trained in an environment that you could use these complex models and you could view them as animal models. And uh, why can you do it? Well, an artificial agent can be trained with such a DNN, can be trained in an environment that is similar to biological agents. These agents have an architecture that is similar to biological agents. And these artificial agents can be trained with behavior that is similar to biological agents. And therefore, I think it's at least interesting to see to what degree these artificial agents can be used in the same way as animal models. An animal model is not an exact replica. You know that there are differences, but potentially you can learn things from them, specifically things that you can't do with the original. And so let's call these artificial agents animals, a DNN animal. Now, what are the advantages of animals over animals? All, anim all elements are known and can be probed. And, and this is not a trivial point. Now, if you have a DNN, you do not only know all elements in the DNN, you also know that these are the elements. And we can have this long discussion about the exact status of a neuron in the brain, but this has not been resolved. What is the correct way of referring to a neuron in terms of computations that are going on. This is a very unclear thing. There's this neuron doctrine, but it doesn't specify how a neuron exactly operates in a computation. It is exactly known how a neuron in a DNN is involved in a computation. And it's also known which elements are into play. It's not that there's some sort of unknown neurotransmitter with a certain role. No, 
if it can be possible in a DNN with those elements, it can be done with those elements. And in that sense, DNNs are much clearer than uh, research with humans or real animals. And DNNs can be, uh, or the animals can be raised with a specific diet of information. I'm, I'm going to show an example of that. And they work for free, but they do cost energy. And they have few of any motivational problems. And there are no known ethical problems with using, breeding, culling, or lesioning DNNs. So from lots of perspectives there, there's lots of promise there, you, it, it, depending on whether there's actually something to be gained here, whether it's actually possible to learn something from DNNs if we use them as demos. And I'm going to go over two examples of uh, using DNNs as animals and trying to understand something about cognition from the type of research I do. And that is my research has been for the last 26, seven years on scene segmentation and object recognition. I do little else. And, and so my examples from, from this field. So, uh, and then I'm going to show a couple of slides on scene segmentation and object recognition, just to give you an idea of the type of problems that we're trying going to solve. So, I, I, uh, this, is a, this is the Rubin vase, and the Rubin vase illustrates an, uh, an element of object recognition. What you, this, uh, this an, uh, you can see both a face in this image or two faces. And so you either see two objects on the side or one object in the center. And crucially, depending on how this border, this border is either owned by the object that you see. So this border is owned, or at least that's how it's described. This border is owned by the face, if you see the face, and this border is owned by the face, if you see the face. And, but, but crucially, what you don't see at the same time are two objects. The border either belongs to one or the other. And uh, observations like this and many others have uh, basically generated us to, let's say, the cognitive psychological view on perception. And what is this? And this was uh, the view certainly up to, uh, let's say, the uh, mid 80s, early 90s. Well, object recognition is a recognition by components. If you have an image, first edges are detected, then there's grouping. And during this grouping, the edges are assigned to the object. And then you somehow have to need to figure out what the object is. Then you actually have a figure ground segmentation. And this figure ground segmented object can then be matched to some sort of template in memory. If you're old enough, this is how it taught you that perception works. And uh, very pioneering uh, research in this concept was done by uh, Eric Biederman uh, already in the 72 and between 72 and 81, he uh, generated these theories that coming out of, uh, well, it's not relevant. Uh, and he thought about, well, what is the ratio between object and its setting in the scene? And he said, well, there are these physical elements and you have interposition is an uh, object in front of something or in its back and then you have to support, does it rest on something or not? And there are also these semantic elements right, where you, for which you need semantic knowledge, like familiar size. Now, objects have a limited set of size relationships with each other. If you know that you have a cat and there's an elephant, the elephant should be substantially larger than the cat, even a very young elephant. And there's a probability. Uh, so uh, certain objects are likely in some scenes and not others. And uh, there's in general also position. Right? Apart from the probability that something occurs in the scene, an object should also have a position, and uh, he uh, and, and remember this is eighty two. He used these uh, images. He showed these images with a stroboscope. Then an object was cued, and he see how, and then he investigated how fast an object was recognized. And when there were these violations of these five rules, you saw that objects people were slower to recognize these images. Very uh, pioneering, very challenging research at the time. And of course, he had lots of these images, something like seventy. And so it needs to be hand produced and uh, researched in uh, 1982. And um, in this line, or confirmed uh, in more recent times by Davenport, uh, Davenport and uh, Molly Potter, was research that showed that if you show, let's say, this bishop or this clergy person in a church, it's easy to recognize him than he, when he's on a football field, or vice versa. This football player is easy to recognize sorry, on the football field than in church. And uh, this is a clear example of that object detection is not processed independent of the scene. And Peter Moon would say this is a semantic effect. Okay, then um, 
So, like I said, most people in my lab have been working on DNNs in this manner, and I will present some of their results in the hope that they will convince you of the sense of this direction. And we're going to look at two examples. One is artificial agents in experiments, and uh, using artificial agents in experiments like humans, and the other is racing and probing artificial agents. So, to start with, for this, um, how do deep convolutional neural networks perform scene segmentation? Uh, uh, so the question we're going to ask is, do they learn the distinction between object and background information? And just that because it can do a task, it doesn't say that it learns an object differentiation between object and background like humans. What's the influence of congruency versus incongruency with background information? And uh, how is it related to network architecture? And you can have, like I said, animals can be of uh, uh, different sources. So you could have core nets as participants. You can have rest nets. These are different types of uh, DNNs. And the rest net basically differs greatly in depth. So you have very deep rest nets. That is, to, so for instance, you have a rest net 50, which has 50 layers. So there are 50 operations succession. And you have a rest net 18, which is much more shallow. There are only 18 operations succession. And then you have core nets. And core nets are basically shallow feed forward networks. So you have a couple of operations of succession, but these can, for instance, repeat. You can have recurrent loops in the core net, or you can have very deep recurrent loops in the core net. And you can use these as test optics. So uh, Noor Seidel, one of my former PhD students, she's, uh, she got her PhD, uh, has been uh, did experiments in which she uh, got these objects in isolation. So this is a guitar, and this guitar was shown in a congruent background as an incongruent background. And uh, if you now present these images to a rest net, and we present them to a very shallow network, network, we see that the performance on the segmented images is kind of OK. The performance on the congruent networks is even better. And the performance on the incongruent networks is worse. And so notice that apparently this DNN picks up the difference between congruency and incongruency. And that, that illustrates that either this is not a semantic effect, as the Biederman hypothesized, or alternatively, that these DNNs have semantic information. Of course, it depends on what you think of what semantic information is. But these types of stuff, whether it's congruent and incongruent, is clearly in the statistical structure of the image that can be learned. Now, if you look at a deeper network, we see that the performance over the board increases. But if we go for really deep networks, we see that the problems with incongruency start to disappear. And so in a network, depth helps with both performance and being less reliant on network. The deeper you are, the better your performance is going to be, and the less you're going to be hampered by the background. And uh, this is an illustration that you can make different architectures and look at effects. And uh, you can, and interestingly enough, you can train these networks multiple times. And so these networks are randomly initialized. So if you train a network 10 times, you actually get 10 different types of response. So you can use these as 10 different animals and derive statistics from them. Or, and now you, well, derive statistics, get an idea of the population variance for it. But you can also do experiments like this. So you can wonder, well, which part of an image is now really relevant? And so you could say, well, I'm presenting a DNN with an image and you get a certain label with a certain level of certainty. Now you can blank out part of the screen and so that you only present the DNN with part of the image. And this likely will induce a drop of certainty. And you can do this for multiple locations. And if you do this for many locations, you can then get the spatial map of which parts of the image are important for classification and which part of the image are not important for classification. And if we do that for shallow and deep networks, what we see here is that for a shallow network, actually the spatial location doesn't really matter. We can blank out anything and it doesn't really hamper performance. But if you go for a really deep network, it suddenly starts to care a lot about where the object is. Because if you blank out the object there, you see a substantial drop in performance, confirming what we saw before that indeed a deep network is mainly focused on the features that belong to the object and a shallow network is not. So with an increase in network depth, the network starts to rely more on the features that belong to the object in classification. So just like with humans, scene congruency exists for DNS. And uh, shallow networks are more influenced by the backgrounds and deeper networks. And that means that for shallow network classification is more determined by all features in the scene than deeper networks. 
So along with many other studies from my lab, it strongly indicates that, and I'm not showing this, but it strong, strongly indicates, we, we have a lot of papers now to show that DNN, so DNNs came on the market, you have these neural networks, and you have really deep neural networks and really good in object recognition. What, what's an idea that we're trying to push? That it's not that they're that good in object recognition, it's that they're that good in isolating features that are relevant for the object. And so that they passively do scene segmentation. Well, why do we care as psychologists? Well, this shows that the brain can compute the operation. Because the brain can compute the operation in DNN, it is a proof of concept that the brain could solve scene segmentation in this manner. And it's actually an elegant way of solving scene segmentation. It is solving scene segmentation by not really solving scene segmentation. It is by developing really nonlinear units that are sensitive for objects in all sorts of configurations, both with itself, its orientation, and with the background. And we never thought it was possible to get that richness of representation, thought that there were all sorts of explicit operations necessary to solve this. But apparently, even with the limited number of units in the DNN, because realize DNNs might be big, they might have a lot of free units, but it's really nothing compared to the brain. With just a few units available in the DNN, it is possible to, to find these, to, to get these really smart, non-linearly tuned units that are just sensitive with enough computations for this object in all sorts of invariant conditions. And I'm not showing, or I'm not proving that the brain or we as humans do it, but I'm proving that we as humans could do it. And this also shows that contrary to dogma, familiarity and lots of other statistical features are not, or at least do not rely on semantic knowledge. And so it's been an argument for, let's say the penetrability of vision that there are the, all of these semantic effects, these semantic effects do not need to rely on semantic information. Just by experiencing the world enough and indeed classifying the objects, but not, let's say, having abstract visions of these objects, or, or that could maybe then be the statistical structure, might be the abstract vision of an object. You get these sensitivities to whether an object is large or small, whether that's deviant, where it should be located in the scene. All of that can just be derived from raw experience and the proper architecture. Okay. So that is, uh, so I hope to just have shown some experiments in which we use artificial agents and basically just treat them like we use uh, human subjects. And you can give them tasks, but the cool thing is you, uh, you, can, you can use these different architectures and then get some sort of idea of what is driving these computations. And they're very, very patient, these demons. But you can go further and you can actually race and uh, race artificial agents in a specific manner. And uh, for this, we used Unity. And notice that in all of the experiments that I just showed you, we presumed there was a certain statistical structure in the way DNNs had been trained. And, and these were basically pre trained networks. So, what we're now going to do is generate a world conformed to our specific statistical, the statistical structure of the world, and then see how the DNNs behave. And for this, we used Unity. And uh, Unity can be used to generate. Sorry, my computer is hampering again. For this, we use Unity, and Unity can be used to generate worlds with stimuli in controlled environments. And with we, I of course mean in this case Philippe Osterholm, because I didn't do it, Philippe did all the work. And he generated for 26 categories of uh, stimuli a multitude of examples. And uh, if, if you just look at uh, whether our different, we use ResNets in this situation. We used to share very shallow net rest net at a performance of about 80 percent the rest of 18 already has a performance of 90 percent and so these tasks can be solved by the dnns and we trained uh, these dnns or we trained lots of dnns with uh, in a specific way so we trained them with uh, for instance a scenario in which in, for instance in this case target category cone was a 75 percent of the cases presented in the home scene and so there was information there also from the scene to be picked up that there might have been a cone but 25% of the scenes were uninformative. And so nothing in the background was informative that it was a cone or not a cone. There was, in that sense, a random background presentation. And vice versa, there was this fire hydrant. And this fire hydrant might have been paired in 75% of the cases with street scenes and in 25% of the cases with uninformative scenes, just like I, I just explained. Now, this is the train. And so then you get a DNN that is trained in a specific world. Cones usually coincide with a home scene, but not always. 
And of course, we're going to see DNNs that are trained with a 75% pairing of home scenes, a 25% pairing of home scenes, a 50% pairing of home scenes, all of these different DNNs. And so we really have an influence on the diet that the DNN is grows up with. And then, of course, comes the testing phase. And in the testing phase, it uh, can be that uh, there's a congruent thing. So it can be that the cone is shown the, with, uh, uh, with in the context of a home scene. So that's congruent. And it can be that the fire hydrant is shown in a street scene. But it's also possible that the cone is now shown in a street scene. And so this is now incongruent. It's used to cones being at home and not in the street, and vice versa. Uh, and so, so you can make these pairings. So we have this training. They train with a certain pairing. There's a certain percentage of reliability where there's pairing of, let's say, in this case, home cone versus home scene, or fire hydrant versus street scene. And, and in the training phase, you can, let's say, conform this with this expectation, but you can also deviate from this expectation. Now, the next scene I need to, I'll, I'll go over. If we now look at the, the, there's a bit much information here. Uh, we see, we here see the, but if we go for the incongruent testing, this is, I guess, most interesting. If you look now at the shallow networks for the incongruent testing, uh, and if we look at the percentage of uninformative scenes in the train set, we see that if the percentage of uninformative scenes in the train set becomes larger, the performance increases. Why is that? Well, if the background is uninformative, it cannot mislead. Uh, but if the background is, inform is, is informative for the other categories, this is a very incongruent example. And then you get a big error. And what we show here basically, and I'm, I'm going to skip the exact explanation because it takes too much time and didn't set it up properly enough. But basically what we're replicating here are the results that we just saw from more. Basically, that even in a controlled environment where you exactly know what the percentage of congruency and incongruency are, we see that a shallow network is very sensitive to the surroundings, but a very deep network doesn't really, for a very deep network, it doesn't really matter how it was trained. A deep network really learns to just only take the features from the object. And we can show that in another way. Or we can now wonder, well, why is this? And why are these deep networks so good at their performance in the shallow networks? Not. And we're, again, we're going to kind of replicate what we did also with the humans, but a bit more fancy. So we can uh, look at the different ResNets. We have ResNet 10, 6, ResNet 10, and ResNet 18. This is the deep network, this is the shallow network. And so we expect a good performance here and a bad performance here. And why is it now that ResNet 6 is performing worse than ResNet 18? Now, we can visualize the scene features that are used in different layers. And so this is an example of probing a DNA. And once you have a DNN, you can just figure out what goes on the different layers. That's still a lot of work because there's a lot of information, but you can do it. And if we now look at ResNet 6, we, 6, we see that there are a lot, of, a lot of small clusters of features being selected that are into play to determine what object is being presented. And with ResNet 10 already, we see that there becomes this nice object selection. And ResNet 18 is even better in it. And so rest at 18 is really good in selecting the features that belong to the object and ignore the features that do not belong to the object. And because it's so good at it, it doesn't really matter whether the background is, let's say, correctly or incorrectly tuned. Subsequently, the response is driven only by the features that are part of the object. And then the problem becomes relatively easy. And so we investigated that a bit by here by looking at how much local maxima were present. And when, then we see that for indeed for a wide range of categories, indeed for ResNet 10, there are lots of different small patches being found. But for ResNet 18, you get these really nice large blobs selected for the objects. So the data suggests that deeper networks are better at recognizing objects because they are better capable of segregating the object from the scene. And deeper networks are more sensitive to the global shape of an object. And with that, shallow networks are more sensitive to congruency effects because they matter. Now, I, and I'm going to skip the critical test. It's really nice, but I, I'm just sending too many details about deep learning or deep learning experiments. Why is this cool or why is this relevant for me? We had, well, we're going to get to that. So we have shown that the best computational models of object perception show biases that humans also have. 
And this model can solve problems such as object invariance and has many other similarities to humans in visual behavior. And I'm not showing these, but they are there. And it is, uh, I, I have a course on this uh, if you're interested. But there, are, it's also not perfect. There are effects that the DNN really doesn't have. But there are lots of unexpected complex forms of cognitions that the DNN can solve. And importantly, these effects are not explicitly programmed, but a side effect of just doing object recognition and being trained to do object recognition better. And that's not only proves the principle that much of psychology of perception can be understood using only basic operations. And that is not necessary to inject all sorts of complex visual routines, of which we really have no good idea of how they operate. And so these, these abstract computations that we needed to specify in this uh, scheme that we didn't really know how it worked or when people tried to make them work fails, they're not necessary. And without these explicit steps like edge detection, grouping, and figure ground segmentation, which, reads, which are, well, at least psychological concepts, a network, you still get the best performing network. So what tells me this, what, what suggests, and, and, and for me, this is, um, Interesting from a multiple from a multitude of dimensions, but also from the following. Remember that we started with the observation that most of our models are really bad at predicting stuff. And then in general, we believe that we really can't use complex models because we don't understand them. I think that with the techniques that we have at our hands, we are actually capable of uh, generating such models. And then probing these models and then actually do getting an extending of how and why these systems work and how and why and why the, what these problems are. Now, if we look at the empirical, I, I want to take a step back to the empirical cycle. And if we look at the empirical cycle and social sciences, uh, psychological results have a tendency to not scale to uncontrolled, uncontrolled reality. And we might think this is where we differ from, let's say, physics. but Notice that an essential part is to isolate an effect and then to test it in pure essence. That's what we do in the empirical cycle. We devoid it of, let's say, all sorts of real world interactions. We, we call it the lab situation. A good lab situation only has one factor. And uh, then you test it in pure essence. Now, subtle effects from natural sciences uh, also don't translate well to the world. If you want to use a semiconductor, you need to have a very well controlled circumstance. And they work in specific circuits, but it's not like they do stuff in general. And so, so if you have these more subtle effects, I'm not talking about gravity, but notice gravity is also something that's uh, exactly present like that in quantum psychology. And that's in, it's not it's not a product or it's it's not a product of a model. Uh, if we look at natural sciences, if we look at application of natural sciences, there's a lot of control in how to do that. And this is not possible for psychological research. And so it, it, it might be that these simple effects would have, uh, these, these, uh, these, these simple models would work better if we would uh, basically pressure society into our lab experiments, but we can't or uh, we don't want to. So uh, for modeling studies, we learned that effect sizes are small and interact. And I plead for an approach to psychological research in which we focus on making good predictive and therefore mega parameter models. And these models can subsequently be used as animal models for humans. And it is that then necessary to subsequently verify these through human behavior. Of course, I'm not saying that you should do this one thing and not step back and see does this match human behavior, does this match uh, human anatomy, does this match physiology. But if it does, from my perspective, it's uh, justifiable to use complex models and simple testing. Thank you for your attention. Oh. Uh, of course, I want to thank the people in my lab.